It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Before we get started, make sure you like, you subscribe if you're on YouTube, if you're on audio, make sure to subscribe, leave a five-star rating and review. I'll definitely give you a shout out if you do leave a five-star rating and review. So I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Very excited about this episode today. Here with me, I have Jamel Gibbs, originally from Brooklyn, New York, Brooklyn in the house and living in North Carolina. Jamel, really appreciate it. Thank you so much uh, for jumping on the show tonight. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. I appreciate the invite. Definitely, definitely. So, Jamal, we talked about this off camera, but I got to tell the listeners, shout out to my wife. Uh, we were hanging out on Saturday just a couple of days ago, and um, we were on YouTube, and Jamel's video came up, a 30-minute video. We watched the entire thing um, about a creative financing strategy that we'll get into a little bit later. And I'm like, you know, I got to reach out to this brother. I got I to gotta see what's going on. And I was looking on your page and everything. I'm just getting game. So I'm like, so I appreciate you. I'm taking some time to get it on, and, and I'm excited to get into the conversation. Hey, man, anything I could do to support, man, I'm here. Definitely, definitely. So, uh, Jamel, I know you've done a whole lot within real estate. Uh, so tell the listeners um, who you are, what you do, um, and just your your history in, in the real estate business. Sure, man. So I started in the real estate industry back in 2002. Uh, just to backtrack off of that, I, uh, fresh out of high school, I graduated um high school in Brooklyn, uh, high school of telecommunications, arts and technology. Um, I graduated in 99, 2000. I was on Wall Street. Didn't go to college. I, I actually registered for Mega Evers. <laughs> oh, wow. College. I was a C&D student, man. So I wasn't like the best student. So I couldn't get into these big universities and stuff. Yeah. So I ended up going with the uh, community college. I registered, but I never went. Um, I was offered a position as a cold caller on Wall Street. And when I was on Wall Street, I kind of learned how to talk to people. I learned how to uh, negotiate on Wall Street. And I learned business on Wall Street. Now, I've always been in business, never had a job or anything like that. In fact, when I was in high school, I used to own a barbershop. But when I was on Wall Street, I really understood what business was about. Um, and and that was going to be my career. I was going to, uh, you couldn't tell me I wasn't going to be successful on Wall Street. Uh, unfortunately, 9-11 happened 2001. The company that I was working for, um, basically all of the investors were pulling out their money uh, because they didn't know what, what was going to happen with the market. And that company went bankrupt. So I started from scratch. I had a friend who was working with Fillmore Real Estate in Brooklyn, uh, the largest real estate company in Brooklyn. Um, I saw him bring home 25 grand one day and I said, OK, this is another avenue that I can go. Um, so he encouraged me to get my real estate license. Um, two weeks later, I was working for Fillmore Real Estate. And um, then I started networking and, and building relationships. And I quickly learned that real estate investing was far better than brokering deals. And that's kind of the, the route that I took from that point forward. That's how I got into real estate. Love it. Love it. So you went to telecom. I went to uh, Madison. I, uh, I played Madison. against telecom in high school. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool, yeah, man. Dope, dope. I remember it's like a small, tiny gym. Yeah. Um, bring back memories, man. Small um, school, man. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. I'm, I, uh, my, my zone school was John Jay, but I didn't want to. If I would have went to John Jay, I probably, <laughs> it would have been, I was a different person back then. So <laughs> I understand. understand. <laughs> dope. So, um, so it sounds like you had a bit of a turning point. You, you were working at Fillmore Real Estate. Were you an agent at that time? I was an agent for a little yeah. while. Um, I, I, be, I, I basically let my license go back in 2006. So from two, I was an agent mm -hmm. for four years. I became a broker as well. Um, but I, I really wasn't practicing heavy with that license because I was more interested in investing. So yeah. from 2002, a couple months after, after I got my uh, real estate license, I started dabbling into how how I can start again into how I can start investing. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any credit. I actually destroyed my credit back then. Um, but I had to figure out how to get in a game. So I, the, the buyers that I was meeting back then, they would show me the ropes. So I, I would find them houses. They would show me the ropes. And I was, 
I was really dealing with the um, with the Hasidic community back then. I had a, a lot of people in that community who would buy real estate from me. Mm-hmm. And it was a guy named Sam Hoffman who really was like, OK, if you want to get into real estate, you got to do it this way. And he kind of showed me what was possible in real estate. And then, you know, it took me about a year to really understand how to uh, how to transact the deal. My first deal, I didn't even know they call it. It was considered to be a wholesale deal, but um, it wasn't necessarily a whole. I didn't call it that because I didn't know what wholesaling was. Didn't exist mm-hmm. back then. But um, I flipped the sandwich shop. I knew a guy who wanted to sell a sandwich shop and I knew one who wanted to buy one. And so I, I just said, hey, pay me $1,500. I'll put you two together. It was a handshake deal. And that was considered to be my first quote unquote wholesale deal. Wow. A couple months later, Sam was showing me the ropes. Um, I ended up selling a million dollar house, uh, flipping a million dollar house in Fort Greene. I made $48,000 and that changed my life. Wow. And at that time, I'm still living in the projects, um, you know, still trying to get by that $48,000 was my proof of concept that I needed in order to go full force with this thing. Um, not too long after that, um, probably a couple of years after that, I, I was making money in real estate from 2002 to th- 2006, but my, you know, I got married, my wife and I, uh, she got pregnant. We moved out of New York to Pennsylvania, uh, January 1st, 2006. Now just to backtrack off of that 2005, the ending of 2004, going into 2005, I started scouting the Reading, Pennsylvania market. 2006, we I decided to pick up and leave. The reason I left is because I bought my first rental property uh, in Reading in 2005. Mm-hmm. I did a video on YouTube, not not to uh, give a shameless plug or anything like that, but I showed some of, <laughs> some of my old HUDs. I have a video showing like stacks of HUDs uh, from 2000 from the old stuff even up into yeah. the new stuff. Uh, and um, that, that one HUD was in there. I thought that was a, uh, that was crazy The memories, but yeah, I, I bought that rental property, moved out to Pennsylvania because I saw, I saw where it was going. And uh, from there, I bought a couple of hundred houses from 2000 and 2005 and going into, I left 2014, but from 2005 to 2008, I probably bought, maybe 50, 60 houses. I was over leveraged and then the market tanked and so did my business. So I had to change up my strategy. I took out less debt on real estate and I got into creative finance, which is, you know, the hybrid strategy that we spoke about. And I also got into more wholesaling. And what I did was I combined the two in order to create one strategy that would allow me to get involved in real estate or stay involved in real estate with very little capital, no credit, just knowing how to structure deals the right way in order to really be able to grow my real estate business. And I'm still doing that strategy today amongst other things as well. Love it, man. We got so much to unpack, so much to unpack within that before we even go forward. So the first thing you mentioned, um, I really want people to talk to, to, to get to understand this. You mentioned that um, one of your clients is actually putting you on game yeah. and showing you the ropes. Yeah, he didn't, realize, he didn't realize. He didn't realize he was doing that, though. You know, I was just listening. Really? Tell me. <laughs> it was. Uh, oh, it was one wow. of those, you know, I would literally show him real estate, and I would ask questions. So he would mm. tell me, "Okay, this is how this is how I do this, and this is how I do that." So he would tell. I guess you would call that putting me on game, but he didn't realize he was coaching me, and I was taking that information in, and going out there and actually applying it. And that's the most important part to this whole thing, right? Uh, we could talk on this podcast forever. We can, I can put out, I have over 400 videos on YouTube. Um, we have Instagram and all of that stuff, right? But if you're listening to the information, but not doing anything with it, then it's useless. It's shelf help, right? You want, you want this stuff to be self-help. You got to apply. You got to do something with the information. And most people, unfortunately, don't. I think there's a, a they call it the 90 10 club for a reason. 10% of the people are wealthy and do it's because they do something with it. 90% are not because they fall back in bad habits, you know? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, and, and something else, and I, I mean, I'm glad, you know, 
you got the information. You got the information, I think, in a very natural way. And you did something with it, to, to, to your point, yeah. you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Your life would be totally different if you just brushed off what he was saying, just transacted the deals. Um, so right. I'm sure you're glad that you that you took action on what you, was, what you were hearing. Well, yeah, for sure, man. And, you know, that kind of led me into other relationships. I, I met, you know, my I consider to be my first real estate, my real first real estate mentor, uh, Steve D. Palantino, uh, in in the Pennsylvania area, he's the reason I was able to a, able to buy so much real estate. He plugged me in with my first private money lender. He helped me to understand how to build a rental portfolio. He had 120 houses back then. That was a lot to me. Um, there was another guy named Sam, uh, not Sam Brinkendorf. There's another guy named Tom. Forget the guy's last name, but he had 5,000 units. So just introducing me to people like this. Steve introducing me and, and let me know. Steve put me on game, right? He let me know what was possible. So I said, this guy has 5,000 units. No, it was Kevin Timochenko. That was his name. I'm just dropping names right now. Kevin had 5,000 units. First person I ever heard uh, with that many units. And I said, that's possible. I can do that, right? So just being introduced and networking with the right people, learning what was possible, but like you said, more importantly, getting out there and actually doing something with it, you know, and uh, changed my life, man. Love it. Love it. Um, so you also mentioned the deal that changed your life where mm-hmm. you, you you flipped the, the million dollar property in Fort Greene and mm-hmm. you made $148,000. Can mm-hmm. you take us to that deal, um, how yeah. that came together and just like closing day and getting that check and just like what was going through your mind because i know everything changed at that point so i would just love to take us back to that point it was it was something that it didn't happen by accident i was literally i didn't have money for marketing or anything like that so i would literally knock on people's doors right and this one lady her name was mrs maitland she she ended up uh saying yes i am interested in selling so I negotiated something with her. She wanted nine hundred and seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. I didn't know if that was going to be possible, but knowing the Fort Greene market, that was actually a really good deal. So I marketed the property after, uh, found the buyer. Um, I can't remember the lady's name that purchased this house, but if I knocked on the door, I would remember. She was a marketing. She was in the marketing business. She ended up buying a house, man, nine hundred and seventy-five grand. I said, Mrs. Maitland, I could get you nine twenty-five. And um, she took the nine twenty five. I kept the fifth, the forty eight thousand, and that was it. So she, I think she made nine twenty seven, and I kept the forty eight, something like that. But the it changed my life, man. I remember taking that check. I still have a copy of it somewhere in my. I think it's over there. But uh, I framed that check because that was the life. That was the shut up check that I needed, right? The the proof of concept, the the check I could take to everybody and say, look, you can shut up now because I did it, right? Um, I remember taking that check to my parents. Now, at that time, both my parents combined. My father was a construction. Uh, he used to work in a window company, knocking out windows, right? So he was a seasonal construction worker. And my mother was a para in the school system. But they were, it was rough. You know, my mother, yeah. had, they had four, I'm the oldest of four kids. So imagine making, you know, collectively $40,000 together trying to take care of four kids and themselves. You know, that's not a lot of money at all. You know, 40 grand is, is basically nothing. Um, I remember taking that check and the look on my parents' face was, it was all, it was all, it, they were, they were inspired by the, the check because this is one, in one check, one month, I made what they made in a year collectively. And I was only 21 years old. And it felt so good to be able to show that check, to be able to show them what was possible and to let them know that I was going to be okay as well. Unfortunately, my mother passed five years ago from cancer. My dad, he moved down here with me to North Carolina, but now he gets to see me doing business on an even larger scale. It's a, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. He, he's just amazed by what I'm doing today. And it feels good to, to know that, you know, he knows that I'm okay. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And um, the next thing you mentioned is that, um, and this kind of like, I was like, wow, you mentioned that you started investing out of state. 
And this is like yeah. before it became cool, before we yeah. had all this technology, before we had all these resources where we could do it all remotely and everything. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through that? Like what made you consider Pennsylvania at that time um, as opposed to like, you know, New York, um, which back then was probably still still probably felt expensive. Um, but walk us walk us through that. Yeah, that's a great question, man. Nobody ever asked me. You know, it's interesting because. You know, they call it virtual wholesaling or virtual real estate. And I was doing it without even thinking about it. You know, um, a lot of stuff and you know, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but a lot of, you know, we've done a lot, you know, especially um, as an African, African-American male, black male um, coming from the hood. We, we got to know how to hustle. Right. So they say, if you want to find greatness, go to the hood. Right. Um, because people are creative and they will find a way to be able to put food on the table. Case in point, uh, I used to work in a barbershop. Um, I owned a barbershop. Right after we would close up, I would go borrow a cab because I didn't have a car. I would go borrow a cab from the cab service, pay the guy $65, drive cabs till four o'clock in the morning, and then uh, gas up and then uh, go right, go home, go to sleep, then go right back to the barbershop. Guess what they call that today? They call it uh, Uber. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, or or what, what's the other car service where you can rent and uh, they can deliveries and stuff like that? Um, I can't remember Lyft. the name. It, it might be Lyft, one of those car services. But the, the yeah. point is, we find creative ways to do things, right? Uh, so, virtual real estate investing. Going back to your to your question, um, I my sister in law she moved out to Pennsylvania. She bought a house in a Reading area. We would go visit. So as we would visit, I'm naturally driving around town. I have a real estate. I have a real estate bug. And I'm like, oh, I can take over this whole town. And that was on my mind. And wow. I said, you know what? I'm going to start buying houses here. This is a whole different area. So, yeah, I was living in Brooklyn and bought my first couple of real a couple of pieces of real estate before I, before I left Brooklyn virtually. And it was a two hour drive. It wasn't that I don't know if I would call it virtual because I was commuting back and forth. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, they call it virtual real estate investing today until I actually moved into the area. Got it. Got it. What was that experience like for you? Just, you know, not necessarily being there every day and all the time. Did you have a hard time knowing that, hey, I'm sleeping here in Brooklyn. Anything could be happening in Pennsylvania. Like, what was that? What was that like? I know a lot of out of state investors that's something that they deal with or some people where they live is too expensive. They don't even consider investing out of state because yeah. of that. So can you, can you talk to us about that? Yeah, honestly, I didn't think about it, man. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't see I, 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 when I first started and even today, I'm still the same way. I don't think about anything. I just do it. And then I figure it out as I go on. That's just one of my personality traits. I don't know if that can be taught, but when you're hungry enough, and when you're not thinking about yourself and when you put other people on your back and you know you have to s support other people, you don't think about what ifs. You think about how can I, right? Mm -hmm. So you start doing, you, you don't, you jump out the window, you just take the risks. So for me, I didn't think about what was happening. I didn't, I didn't worry about the properties. I was more concerned about how can I get more, right? Versus, you know, what if this tenant you know, what if this tenant calls me at two o'clock in the morning? I didn't think about that stuff. And to be honest with you, if you treat people the right way, and I learned this very, very young, if you treat people the right way, people will take care of you. And no matter what their situation is, hey, I'm going to be late on rent today. Okay, that's not a problem. You know, when can we talk? I won't charge you a fee. That's taking care of somebody, right? If you take care of people, they will take care of you. They'll make sure you're straight. Um, and that's kind of how I always operate in my business. That's why I've never been to court in real estate. And I don't want to say wow. it's never going to happen, but I had a, over, over a couple of thousand deals at this point. I've never, ever, ever been to court regarding a real estate transaction. The only time I've ever been to court is when I took one person to court. It was the first time. It was last year. I took a contract to the court because he tried to get over on, on the contract that we had from some money that I paid him. Um, that was the only time I've ever had a court case. Um, but again, if you take care of people, you don't have to worry about all of that other stuff. And then you can keep your blindness on and focus on what's more important, getting more deals, man. Love it. 
Love it. So um, you mentioned earlier, too, that you were able to scale up pretty quickly in the Reading area. Um, what type of financing were you using back then? I know there was a period of time where if you were breathing, you can get a mortgage. So what were you yeah. getting those kind of deals? Like what was the financing like at that time? Honestly, when I moved to Reading, um, I had decent credit because I, I built my credit score back up. So I started off with some FHA mortgages and things like that to get my first couple of rental properties. And then shortly, at, very shortly after that, Steve introduced me to some people um, who became private money lenders. And that just, you know, after that, I, it was sky was the limit. You know, I, I got offered, you know, they saw how much hustle I had in me. And, um, you know, she just lent me money and that was it. You know, um, honestly, um, I had a really good reputation for doing what I say I was going to do all the time, even if it hurts. And that's kind of my motto. Do what you say you're going to do all the time, even if it hurts, right? Case in point. Uh, so this person owned a title company in the area and she would lend money to investors. I remember when a market tank, I had tons of money out there um, that, you know, I, there was no way I was going to be able to pay her back her money, but I found a way to pay her back her money. I could have filed bankruptcy on the business and that would have been, well, I, I would have walked away and that would have been that. But do what you say you're going to do all the time. And if it, even if it hurts, right, you don't leave people cold turkey like that. Paid her back every last red cent. You know what she did? She turned around and gave me a larger line to help me get back on my feet after the fact, because I said I did what I said I was going to do. Um, we we're, we're still close friends today because I did what I said I was going to do. If I need anything, she's there because I did what I said I was going to do. Right. So you don't burn relationships. You don't burn bridges. That's part of being in business. Right. Don't worry about yourself first. Take care of other people and they'll take care of you. I said that already, right? <laughs> yep, definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, so it sounds like, you know, you're able to use private money and different creative strategies to, to yep. scale up. Um, and I think you mentioned you had, eventually you purchased like a couple hundred properties in the area. Is that right? Yeah, it was a couple of hundred in the Reading area. Um, I did pretty well with that. Um, and that wasn't all through... They call it the, uh, that wasn't all through creative finance or using private money on all of them. Um, it was a mixture of both. I built up a nice portfolio. They call it the Burr strategy now, uh, which means that you're buying a house, you're refinance, uh, you're uh, rehabbing a house, renting a house, refinancing a house, and then repeating, right? They call it Burr. Um, that was the way to really get paid. That was a, I don't know who made up the name Burr, but we've been doing that forever. Um, the, the point of me saying that is that was one way to do it. And then once I was over leveraged, I had to find other ways to, to buy real estate. My first creative deal was a lease option deal. And then I, I found out about owner financing. And then I kind of co started combining all of these things together to use creative ways to buy real estate. And real estate to me, honestly, is one of the best businesses to be in because you can negotiate anything, literally, as long as it's legit, you can negotiate it. And as long as you ask for it and you know how to put it together and then you get an attorney or a title company to close the deal, you can make anything happen. And I've taken the skills from real estate investing and applied it to buying laundry mats. For example, we buy, we make seller finance offers on laundry mats, um, car washes, uh, you know, things like that, right? You could apply the same strategies from real estate into the business world to be able to buy, buy cash cows. And, um, you know, it's just a skill that you need. You, you need to understand negotiation. You need to know how to, how to put these deals, these uh, deals together. You'll be fine. Love it. Love it. Um, so you mentioned um, a lease option deal. Can you walk us through that deal and also describe like what is a lease option? Sure. So basically when you think about lease options, um, think of, Think about it like this. Uh, let's say you you had a house that you uh, wanted to sell. And I said, hey, I don't want to buy it yet, but I do want to buy it. How about I rent it from you for a little while? And then eventually I'll buy it at this set price. That's it, in a nutshell what a lease option deal is. You're renting a house for a period of time with the option to purchase it at a certain price. That's pre-negotiated before you even sign a contract. Right? So- I found somebody who, he was an investor. He owned 40 houses. He um, 
one of his houses had a fire or the house next door had a fire. Uh, the houses were connected. He ended up uh, getting some insurance money to rehab the house. He did everything in the house all over again. In fact, when you walked into the house, you could still smell the fire, even though it was rehabbed. Um, the only thing he didn't do was the flooring. So I bought that from him. I said, what do you want for this? He said, I'm paying $435 a month. If you just pay me $435 a month and pay me 40 grand, which is what I have in the, the, the house, I'll let, I'll let you uh, lease option this you know, from me. So I negotiated that with him. I turned around, found a buyer. I just listed it on Craigslist and I still do it to today. That's one of my strategies. Um, listed it on Craigslist, found somebody who was willing to pay me 70000 put down $10,000. I didn't have to put a deposit down on the house. I basically got, got into the deal with no money out of pocket. I made $10,000 up front. I charged the guy $900 a month. So I made about a, a little less, about $450 a month in passive cash flow. And then the guy cashed me out about 12 months later and I made another 30 grand. So I made $40,000 plus the amount that I, what was it, 450 a month for 12 months, whatever that is. I think it was like five grand. Uh, total, I think it was like $45,000 on a deal that I did. I, I didn't, I, I never owned the, the, the house. Um, I basically did nothing to the house. Um, the guy who moved in, he put new carpet in. That was the only thing that needed to be done in the house. And I said, this is a play right here. And I just started doing it. And, you know, today we call it the hybrid strategy. Man, that, that's, that's mind blowing. That's mind blowing because I'm just trying to process like that's, that's, that's crazy. Like how. So here's, like, here's how this works how you, best. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Here's how this works best, right? And, you know, I, I get a, a ton of feedback on YouTube. People don't understand the strategy. It really is simple. You're focusing on, there's two, when you're buying real estate, there's two types of people that you can focus on. Um, physical distress or financial distress, right? Two types of properties. You got physically distressed properties, financially distressed properties. With the hybrid strategy, it works no matter if you're doing physical or financial, but it, financial distress is going to lend itself to like subject to deals, wraparound mortgages, things like that. Physical distress can lend itself to seller financing or lease options, right? Here's why. You got somebody who has a property. They don't have the money to fix the property up. And some people might say, well, why don't they just go ahead and sell it rather than taking the payments over time? Well, because if they sell it, they're not going to get what they want anyway. And they need the money to put into the property. So if they don't have the money to put into the property, what are they going to do? So here you are saving them from this property, negotiating something with them. That's going to be a win-win. You want to make sure that they win and make sure you win. Right? So you can negotiate something that's going to benefit them. You can get the property off of their hands, remove the headache, and then you can go out and create a profit. You just got to have the vision to be able to do it. So when you're focused on the distress, which, which again, it could be physical or financial distress, you're, you're focusing on the 10%, not the 90% of people who want to get top dollar for their properties. So once you realize that and you put yourself in a position to be in front of these people, you can negotiate anything. And you'd be surprised who will say yes. Now, even within that 10%, 90% of them are going to tell you no. But again, you're not looking for the 90, you're looking for the one and the one will make you wealthy. So you, you find deals within, it's like, I like to describe it like a needle in a haystack, right? So you got one needle in a haystack is not going to help you. But if you put yourself in a position to put multiple needles in the haystack by literally putting yourself in front of these people, it will be easier to find the needles, right? So if I'm focusing on, uh, if I'm pulling a list, for example, right? If I'm, if I'm pulling a list and I'm focused on houses that are 30 years old, the owner lived there for 10 years, uh, or at least owned the house for 10 years. Um, I know that the house probably needs some work because it's 30 years old. It's an older home. 
if they own the house for at least 10 years, that tells me that there's some equity in there. So we can play around with that a little bit. And if I add a layer of distress on there, like for example, absentee owner, vacant property, a vacant property basically means there's no income coming into the house. An absentee owner means the owner doesn't live there, doesn't necessarily mean that they're in distress, but what if they have a tenant that's not paying rent, right? Mm -hmm. I can add that layer of distress in there and literally put myself in front of that type of person and be able to help them out of their situation. So it's like I'm in the right place at the right time all the time, right? Definitely. So once I find that person, all I got to do is ask him four simple questions. What do you want for the house? Um, I don't ask them, I don't necessarily word it that way. I say, what do you need in order to be able to sell this house? The reason I ask, what do you need is because if you ask them what they want, they're going to tell you what they want. I'm going to ask them what they need so that they'll tell me exactly what they need. And then we can negotiate from there. Because if I ask the seller what they want, they might want 200,000 for a house. But if I say, what do you need? They might only need 50 grand. And what if they have a $50,000 mortgage? I'm into the deal at 100 grand, which is 50% of the 200,000. So ask them what, to find out what they want, not what they need. You want to provide, I'm sorry, find out what they need, not what they want. If you find out what they need, you can negotiate a much better deal. It's just how you, how you word things. Use these, uh, these, these little tactics in order to be able to, uh, get the information that you need in order to create a deal, right? So mm -hmm. I want to negotiate. I want to find out what they what they need. And then once they tell me what they need, I'm going to say, is that really the best you can do? So I'm going to ask you a question. Um, how much do you need for this uh, property today? Uh, 75,000. 75,000. Now, I, I totally understand. I, I really appreciate you uh, providing that information. I think 75,000 is possible. Uh, but I got to look at, look to see what other houses in the area are actually selling for. Is that really the best you can do? 75,000? Maybe like 68, I think would be okay. So did I negotiate with you or did you just drop the price yourself? <laughs> you dropped the price. You dropped the price. I just asked you a question, right? You negotiated with yourself. I didn't ask you to drop the price. I just said, is that really, so you, you see how I asked the question though, right? Is that really the best you can do? Right? Is the tone of voice, is, is uh, the eye contact, is, is everything, right? So it's how you ask the questions that will make the difference. So if I'm, if you're at 75,000, you literally just gave me $7,000, right? So that shows me a level of motivation right there. Is that really the best you can do? No, I could probably do 68. That tells me there's some there's some motivation right there. You literally just gave away seven thousand dollars. I might have been I might have been interested in paying the seventy five grand, right? But by you dropping the price, you and people believe it or not, I know that was kind of scripted. Well, mm -hmm. not really. It wasn't. It wasn't it at wasn't all. Scripted. I knew I was coming. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wasn't scripted. But yeah. here's the deal: people do it all the time. Yeah, they do it all the time. This really happens in the real world. Right. So now I got you off the price. Now, you know, keeping that 60 now, now my new target is 68,000. Right. So I'm like, okay, sounds good. So let me ask you this. So 68,000 is a number. If I had, if you had to rate the property from one to a five, one being the worst, five being the best, where do you feel like your property falls at condition wise? Maybe, maybe like a four. A four. Okay. Perfect. And what would you say the square footage is on, on your property? About 1800. 1800. Now, watch this. You ready? So, if so, you're saying that the property it, it needs it needs some some things done to it in order to really be in tip top shape, correct? So, you're, you're rating it at a four. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yeah. If you had to put some money into this property, what would you do to the property? I would put in new floors, um, change the windows and maybe get some new appliances so you would change the windows put in new floors uh you feel like you need some paint as well yeah i'd say paint too okay now with that in mind how much money would you say you would have to invest in order to get 
the property in that condition? Probably 10 to 15,000. So now notice what I did. I got you to drop the price. Then I got you thinking about how much money you got to put into the house. Just by asking questions. Did I negotiate with you? Did I say, oh, I feel like the house needs $15,000? No, you told me the house needs $15,000. So all I'm doing is asking you questions. That's it. Right? And by yeah. asking you questions, I'm pulling out information. But at the same time, you're thinking about everything you're telling me. So now guess what happens to the price? Because you told me it needs 68000 I mean, you well, you want 68000 but it needs $15,000 in work. So naturally, even if I don't ask for it, you're going to think, oh, there's no way I could get $68,000 right now because I got to, you know, I got to do all this extra stuff to the house. Right. So I might come yeah. in, at, you know, at 60 grand and, and that might be a win for you. You, you probably would have thought, hey, 68000 minus 15, that's probably 53. But I come at 60. You're like, let's let's sign it up today. Right. Now watch this. So I, I found out how much work the property needs. I found out what you want for the house or what you need for the house. Now, let me ask you this. Now, here's how, now that's structuring a wholesale deal or a creative deal, uh, not a creative deal, a wholesale deal or a cash offered type of deal. Now, I like to ask multiple questions in order to see the be what's the best type of deal to pull out of something like this. So let me ask you this. So Obviously, the house, you know, you're saying it needs $15,000 in work. You, you would like $68,000. What do you feel like the house is valued at today? Um, I would say like sixty five. dollars I think is a good, solid, solid uh, value for it. So you feel like it is worth sixty five dollars right now? Yeah. Completely, if, if it was, if you were to put it on the market today, and if it, if it was completely fixed up, Let's say you gave it a five, you would feel like it was worth sixty five thousand. Well, if it was a five, maybe like a hundred though, maybe like a hundred. A hundred thousand, okay. So a hundred thousand. Um, you realize you're asking for sixty eight thousand, but you realize any fifteen thousand dollars in work. So are you still kind of gun ho with the sixty eight thousand, or are you looking? Are you flexible on that? I have some flexibility because I know, you know, it, it needs a lot of work done and, and you'd probably be doing some of that if you did buy it. So I, I'm open. So what, what was you really want? What would you really need to walk away with in order to make this, this thing happen today? 64, 64,000. Okay. Let me ask you this. What if I were able to get you that $68,000, right? Um, would you be interested in taking payments over time? Oh, I mean, yeah, I, I would be definitely, I, would, I didn't expect that, but you know, tell me more. Okay. So based off of what you're telling me, you know, I think, you know, if the house, if I can get it up to a hundred thousand dollar valuation, it would be worth it for me to buy it. I'm interested in purchasing the house at $68,000 today. Um, but in exchange for the $68,000, i am willing to negotiate something where I can make you uh, monthly payments over time. So, and then I would just, I would have to, let me close out. So what I need to do is look at the numbers. Uh, let me see what I can possibly rent the house for. And then I'll give you, I'll give you a call back in about an hour and, and we can discuss uh, how this can benefit both me and you. Is that fair? That sounds then, good. All right. So what I would do, I would normally make an offer over the phone. Sometimes I don't, it, you know, in this situation, I didn't run comparable sales. I didn't do any of that stuff. Right. So I'm basing everything off of what you told me. Uh, now, what I could have done instead of getting off the phone, I could have said, so let me ask you this. What do you feel like the house will rent for? If it was in tip top shape. Um, $800. $800. So here's what I'm prepared to do today. If you're willing to take payments in the amount of $400 a month, I would completely take over, um, you know, uh, owning the property. Uh, I will make payments. I will make 120 payments of $400, and then I'll cash you out with a lump sum amount at the end. Um, you know, would you 
be open to something like that? I would. You say what you say, and then you know that's you just ask for it. You know what I mean? So what you're doing is you're getting you're getting yeses. You're getting a seller to think about what they're telling you about the property. They realize it's in some t- form of distress. They, re- you know, once they realize it's in some form of distress, um, they're what they're doing is they're realizing that it's going to be tough for them, tougher for them to sell it. Or if they do sell it, it's probably going to sit for a little while. And if it's not going to sit, um, they're probably somebody's going to come in and drop the price anyway. So I'm giving you what you want in exchange for you accepting my terms. So I can make you a cash offer for $60,000 today, Mr. Seller, or I can pay you the 68,000 if you're willing to take four, uh, 120 payments of $400. So 120 payments is basically 10 years, but I'm not going to, what sounds longer, 10 years or 120 payments? You know, I'm going to tell you 120 payments, even though it's 10 years. Makes sense. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of psychology in there, um, a little bit of influence in there, but it's more so me asking you questions and you telling me, you're basically negotiating with yourself. You're telling me what you want and I'm agreeing with you and I'm going to give you exactly that in exchange for what I want. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And it, it really is that simple, man. It's just asking questions and knowing how to position it the right way in order to not allow the seller to put their guards up. Cause most people will put their guards up when you start asking personal questions, but do it in such a way you got to reword things in order to, to not have them put up their defenses, but be open to discussing how you can, you can help benefit them in the long run. And that's basically what this is. People don't like when I say this, but it's the truth. Real estate is sales. So you got to know how to sell. Right. I don't care if you're renting a house. I don't care if you're buying a house. I don't care if you're selling a house. Real estate is sales. Once you understand sales and you understand negotiation, you can negotiate anything and be able to get it or at least a percentage of it. You know, so um, so now you understand what type of person you need to target. And then you're putting yourself in front of those people and then you're asking the right questions in order to receive the property. And then once you receive the property. Now you're putting yourself in a position. Let's say you want to do a hybrid deal where you sell it on a lease purchase. Now you're specifically looking for a person to help, right? All of this is helping people, right? I'm positioning myself in front of the seller to help the seller out of their situation. And then I'm positioning myself in front of the buyer in order to help them become a property owner, right? So uh, you, you might come across a buyer who has money, but bad credit. Maybe they, their credits, you could run your, you could max out all your credit cards and your credit score drops. Doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person. You're making your payments on time, right? You just maxed out. Um, some people might miss a payment, right? Maybe they lost their job and a credit score dipped, but now they're working again, but the credit score is still low. You know what I mean? There's people in these situations, right? So what you do is you position yourself in front of these types of people. No banks needed. Uh, buy or, or at least purchase this this house you know um no bank qualifying you use languages like that to draw out those types of people who will mm-hmm. contact you um low down payment you know they understand they got to put down a down payment and they don't need a bank so now you reach out to those people they contact you back you uh, take a down payment from them you lease the property to them and they might even have the money to fix the property up, like the guy who put the carpet in the house. You understand what I mean? Yeah. So they're not coming in with the, this is a lease purchase. This is not a regular rental. So they're not coming in with the regular renter's mentality. They're coming in with a home buyer's mentality. I have to put some money into this house. This is my house. I have to take care of this house. Because the end goal is for them to repair their credit within you know, 24, 36 months, however long you, you, you negotiate with them, get them to, in a position to become mortgageable. And then they balloon payment you out. They give you a lump sum once they receive the mortgage from the, uh, the, uh, the mortgage company. And then you move on to the next deal. So that's one way of doing it. Another way is just to keep it as a rental, which would mean in that case, you would actually put money into the house, make it nice, 
Uh, you could use private money in order to be able to do that. So you can get seller financing from the seller and then you get private money to be able to rehab the property. Then you just keep it as a regular rental. You know, it says that's just another way to do it as well. You know, but um, these are just different creative ways that you can buy real estate. There's plenty more um, that I teach in my hybrid wholesaling uh, program. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's um, it's just about thinking outside the box. How can I structure this? How can I ask the right questions? How can I put myself in front of these people? Right. And how can we create win-win situations? Definitely, definitely, definitely. Appreciate that breakdown. And I think the best part about the back and forth we did is like a lot of, you know, some people might not hold on to like the theory of it or like the definition explanation of it. So I think it was cool that we were able to to walk through that example and it wasn't scripted y'all i didn't see that coming but um i think that was i think that was dope it was like live practice so i appreciate that breakdown yeah i hope i wasn't talking too much man i was just <laughs> oh no you're good you're good you're good so you know i i can tell you're a passionate guy so i'm, I'm like i got i gotta let him go i gotta let him let him let him do his thing but that was really helpful um something else you mentioned that i don't believe we discussed on the show before is wrap around mortgages what what is that what does that mean and how do you like so, execute that wrap around mortgages what it is is a form of seller financing, right? Uh, it's kind of like a subject two deal. Uh, the difference between a wrap and a subject two. So think of a um, subject two deal is you taking over payments. You ever see the signs on the side of the road? We take over payments. Um, what they're doing is they're trying to buy your house subject two, right? Subject to the existing finances. So what that means is you deed the house to them, um, and they uh, keep the mortgage in your name and make your monthly payments, right? Um, a wrap is slightly different in a sense that you're creating almost like a second mortgage to wrap the existing mortgage that's that's on the property in order for you to be able to purchase the house. So if you have, let's say a seller owes $75,000 on a house, but they want $100,000, what you would do is create a new mortgage for $100,000. It will wrap their $75,000. The, the $75,000 you're paying uh, to the third party company and then the 25 is paid to the seller separately. You understand? So it's a wraparound. There is just one big mortgage with two different payments going out to uh, the seller and the bank. You get the deed on the property, the finance, the initial 75,000 stays in the seller's name, but the 25,000 is paid to them, which is their profit. And that's paid on a monthly basis. Does that make sense? Got it. So is it, so it's like an actual mortgage, like with a mortgage company that, no, that it's, or it's, it's like, seller it's, financing. Like, it's just like doing oh, a sub, so, I compared it to subject two for a reason. So a subject two deal, mm -hmm. you're actually taking over the payments, but the seller is not getting anything out of it. Right. It will be, it will be illegal. Right. A wrap allows you to take over the seller's payments and provide a profit to the seller in the form of owner financing. So you're literally taking oh. over their payments and then making uh, another monthly payment to the seller in the form of seller financing via, and, and, and that uh, co combination is called a wraparound mortgage. So you're literally wrapping a new mortgage around the existing mortgage. Got it, got it. And in that situation, like would the, would the mortgage still be in the seller's name or would it be in your name? The mortgage like the, would be the in, in the seller's name because you're taking over their payment, but then you'll owe the uh, additional mortgage. Sorry. You'll owe the additional mortgage to the seller. You Got understand? It. Yeah. That's how that works. So then the house will be deeded over to you. You make your monthly payments and then that's it. Got it. Got it. So it's basically um, a form of subject two. That's what it is. It's a form of subject two, and subject two is a form of seller financing. Got it. So just to recap, so subject two is basically you're taking over, you're basically making the seller's payments. They're not getting anything out of it. You're making the payments, and they deed the property over to you in that right. situation, right? That's it. And then the, the, the wraparound mortgage is you take over the seller's payments, and they also get additional payments from you so they do get something out of it they get something additional out of it in that sense right so 
Wow. Generally speaking, you on a on a wraparound mortgage, you can make one payment, but it's split between the seller Got and it. their initial payment. Right, right, right. Another thing about a wrap, which I think is better than subject to, um, the wrap allows the seller to offset the debt on the property. So mm. um, if a seller wanted to sell a house through a wraparound mortgage, uh, let me take a step back. If a seller wanted to sell a house through subject to, they can't offset that debt. They can't show that you're making their monthly payment. So if they go and try to buy another house, that debt to in- their debt to income ratio is all screwed up because they still have that debt on their name. With a wraparound mortgage, they can offset the debt, right? So they just ask their attorney that's closing the deal or a title company that's closing the deal for, you know, a letter for the bank for the bank stating that, you know, this debt is being paid off by someone else. It's the wraparound mortgage. So that's the benefit. I, I believe that people should be buying on wraps versus subject to in order to benefit a seller. But it depends on the situation as well. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. So you went over a lot of creative strategies. And um, I don't think I don't know if we've gone over the hybrid yet. Um, but we have gone over like the first part of it, just like getting the seller, you know, getting seller finance situation. So part two of that is finding a buyer. Um, finding a buyer who's looking uh who's looking to buy a house. Um, so can you talk about that part of it? Because yeah. in the video that I watched, um you basically talked about, you know, you made money in the beginning, middle, during, and the end um, yeah. with like virtually nothing out of your pocket. Um, so can, yeah. you, can you t- break that down? So let's go back to the deal that we are negotiating together fictitiously, yeah. right? So yeah. I negotiate a deal. I know the house is, I did my research at this point. I see the house is valued at 100000 You said it needs $15,000 in work. Um, I'm going to give you the $68,000. I'm going to pay you the $400 a month seller finance. But now I'm going to go out and find a buyer, right? I'm going to put an ad, you know, all on Facebook marketplace, maybe Craigslist and a couple, a couple of other, maybe Zillow, a couple of other places that's going to say something like no banks needed, um, uh, down payment only $900 a month, right? So now, rather than, you know, I know that I'm going to give you $400 a month. I'm targeting people that are specifically um, not looking to go to a bank for a mortgage. They know that they have to put down a down payment and they're expecting $900 a month now. Right. So I know that local rents are going for 800 based off of what you told me, but I'm asking for a little bit more because I'm doing a lease purchase. You can you can bump it up. 10 to 20%, right? So now I'm providing home ownership. So I'm, I'm getting these people to come in. Um, they're going to ask me, how much do I want for the house? I'm going to tell them $100,000. Um, I'm also going to tell them I need 10% down, um, which is small down payment. Um, and then I'm going to tell them the payment is going to be $900 a month. I'll credit them back. I don't have to credit them anything, but if I want to spice up the deal a little bit. I can say, look, I'll credit you back a hundred dollars. Now remember $800 is what the rents are going for. I'm telling them nine, I can give them a hundred dollars back towards their closing cost. Right? So basically what I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm going to tell them, look, I'm going to give you some of this money back so that you won't have to come up with this money at the end. And let's say I'll give you 36 months. Over three years, you're going to build up $3,600 that you can put towards the closing costs. Um, and when you balloon payment me out, when you when you get a mortgage on a property, um, that $3,600 will be applied as a credit to you, right? So all I'm doing is collecting 10%. It's a non-refundable option deposit, right? So I can either take that off, of, off the price or not. Generally, I like to take it off the price, right? So as an option deposit, if the, if they're paying a hundred grand, they're gonna owe me ninety. I'm going to give them a hundred dollar credit every month, so I'm basically giving them thirty six hundred dollars after three years, and then they're gonna make a nine hundred dollar payment to me every month. That out of the nine hundred, 
let's say, how much did you want down? Let's just throw a number out there. How much did you want down to in order to be five thousand? Five thousand dollars. So now they just gave me ten, right? I'm gonna give you five of that ten, and I'm gonna keep five. So now I made five thousand dollars up front. Now I'm giving you four hundred dollars of that nine. Guess what? How much money I make every month? I make five hundred dollars in cash flow every month, right? Over three years, let's do 36 months times three. How much is that? Uh, times five. 36 times five is how much? Let's see. 36 times five. 180. So I make another $18,000 on top of the five grand for as long, you know, over that three year period. So if we add 18 and so that's 23,000. And then remember, I owe you 68,000 when I sold it to them. For they're gonna owe me ninety. So what's the difference between ninety and sixty? I think it's twenty two. Twenty two thousand. So uh, twenty two thousand plus what was it? Twenty three thousand. Forty five thousand dollar profit on that deal with no money out of pocket. How was it no money out of pocket? Well, they provided me with the down payment. I gave you your down payment. I kept the other half. They're paying. Nine hundred dollars a month. I'm paying you four hundred, and then they're paying me ninety grand, and I'm only paying you sixty eight grand. So I just created a deal out of thin air, and they're responsible. I'm selling the property to them as is. This is not a rental situation. I want to make that very clear. This is not a regular rental. This is a home purchase, right? I could have beefed the price up on a lease purchase. To future value the property four hundred and ten thousand. Rather than doing that, I said I'll sell it to you for hundred. So I'm basically giving you ten, fifteen thousand dollars that you can apply towards your uh, rehab anyway. So I, I'm willing to bet. You know, the average home is going to go up four percent each year over three years. What is that? Twelve percent on hundred thousand dollars. That's twelve grand right there. Right. So that extra money. You're going to come out of your pocket with to fix up the property. And if you ever wanted to sell it, I'm willing to bet you're going to be able to sell it for 110 to 115 later on anyway. You understand? So yep. that's how this whole thing works. I get a deal with no money out of pocket. I get to make 45 grand. You get to make your 68,000 in cash flow every month. Right. And I'm still going to owe you the 68 grand. I'm mm -hmm. not, we're not deducting that off of, that's just rent. We're not deducting. So that's how you benefit. You don't have the headache of, you know, the tenant contacting you at three o'clock in the morning. That's my mm -hmm. responsibility now. So you get to make a positive, you get your 68 grand plus $400 a month. That's how you're winning. I get every benefit that I've already mentioned and the buyer gets a property without having to go to a bank. They get to make, a, they, they get a, a buyer's credit towards their closing costs. They're future valuing the property right? But they're getting it at a discount to be able to cover the rehab. It's a win, win, win all the way. No matter how you look at it, it's a win, win situation. We create home ownership and we eliminate problems for the seller while we make a profit. Hybrid wholesaling. Love it. Love it. Love it. And I did see this in the video. This next question I'm going to ask, how do you, what is one way you find sellers um, who are open to something like this. And it blew my mind when you mentioned it because I'm thinking, you know, maybe you got to skip trades or like pull a list or something like that. But you did it in a way that we were probably looking for houses anyway. Yeah. Um, so can you can you talk a bit more about that? So we're just looking, again, we're looking for, this, this is kind of why I mentioned it before, we're looking, we're literally looking for distress, right? You could find distress anywhere. I did it on Zillow that, that yep. time, right? It was on Zillow. Uh, you could do it on Craigslist. You could do it on forsalebyowner.com. It doesn't, you could do it, you know, just walking down the house and calling up a uh, walking down a street and, and calling up a, a for sale by owner sign. The, the point is the questions you ask will dictate what you're able to do on a deal. That's what most people don't understand. You're asking questions in order to see what's going to be possible between you and a seller. If a seller might, if 90 sellers are going to tell you, uh, get out of here, then there's no deal. But if five of them say, yes, you know, I'm willing to talk about it. Now you open up the doors for opportunity, right? So you just got to call enough people. It's a numbers game. You know, it's, it's sales. That's what exactly what it is. Uh, you call enough people, you put yourself in front of the right people, and you'll make deals. I guarantee you, 
and guarantee is a strong word. I probably shouldn't use that. But um, <laughs> if we go in, because you know how people people are sensitive, man. So <laughs> <But> <laughs> if we if we go in, you said uh, it was a guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> but look, if we go in Zillow, and I'm telling you, if you contact, if you if you look for houses that has been on the market for, we're literally looking for distress when we do this. If you go on and you say, okay. Rather than searching for the houses that are brand new, because these people are more than likely going to want top dollar for the house, let's look for the houses that's been on the market for at least 60 to 90 days. They're probably willing to talk to you a little bit more, right? So now that's a layer of distress. On top of that, if I'm specifically looking through the pictures on Zillow of these houses and I see that these houses need some work, now that creates another layer of distress. So now we're looking, we're literally looking for distress. And we're looking to open up the conversation to these people in order to be able to position what we're able to help them with. You know what I mean? So um, if I contact enough of those people, say I may get a goal to talk to five of them a day, five days a week. That's 25 people a week over the course of a month. And I'm making 25 offers a week. Do you think I'm going to get a deal over, over the course of a month? Absolutely. It only takes 15 to 20 offers to get a solid contract for the average brand new person. So if I'm making five offers every single day, five days a week for a month, I made a hundred offers. If I make a hundred offers and 99 say no, but one says yes, do you, you, you think that was a good month for me? If I can make 40 grand? Of course. How many people are making $40,000 a month right now? Most are not. <laughs> Most are not. In fact, I would venture to say 99% of the people are not. But if you just believe that you can do this, because it's a, it takes a mindset shift. Some people might think it's a scam. I've seen over the last few weeks, you'd be surprised at what I've seen on YouTube. They're like, oh, this is a scam. It's because you don't understand it. Everything is not a scam. All right. Everything you see on TV isn't real, but everything is also not a scam. If you're able to make money with it, it's be there's legitimate ways to make money and there's not legitimate ways to make money just because you think it's a scam because you don't understand. It doesn't necessarily mean um, it's a scam, right? I've been doing this for over, for over 15 years. Um, you just got to change your mindset. It's the way you, th if you believe that you can do it, you can do it. If you believe that you can't, you're absolutely right. Who said that Henry Ford, right? Um, so it's the way you think about things. If you're willing to open up your mind, if you're willing to learn, have an open mind, if you're willing to um, uh, do the work because it's not easy. You know, most people, you know, they, they see, hey, I could buy a rental property with no money. But the caveat to that is you got to put in the work. You know, it's not easy. It's not a get rich quick scheme. You got to put in some work in order to make this happen. And once you understand, it becomes easier over time, of course. Uh, like deals are falling my lap at this point. I've been doing it for 20 years. But what you didn't see was the five o'clock in the mornings, the 20 hour days, the no sleep for 48 hours for years and years and years. And, it, you know, in exchange for what I have today. Right. The not having fun in my, all of my 20s and half of my 30s. You know, this is not an overnight success thing for me. I've been working at this for years. I, yes, I, I've been financially well off since I was 30, um, able to semi-retire at 30. I choose to work at this point. But, you know, again, I was putting in work in order mm -hmm. to make that happen. That's what people don't see. You know, so they see a video pop up on YouTube, which I released January 2021. It just popped up two weeks ago. And now you know, you get a little bit of success from that. I'm not saying I'm a, you know, my channel is, you know, uh, has a million subscribers, but the point is it was the work we put in, we, right. we planted the seeds. Now it's the harvest. The harvest is coming, right? So business is all about seasons. You got the planting phase, you got the harvest, uh, the, the, the growing phase, and you got the harvest, right? The harvest comes after some time. Definitely, definitely. Man, Jamel, so much game, so much game, man. Um, appreciate you like breaking down things so specifically. Uh, so talk to us a little bit. Where are you at now? You know, what does your business look like? What does your portfolio look like? Like what is what is Jamel doing in real estate these days? 
I'll be honest, man. My my main goal. I'm I'm forty. I'll be forty two in a few months. What what I've been doing, man, is um, doing a lot of creative real estate investing, especially right now. The market is unbelievable right now. All of those people that have uh, 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 wanted to sell over the last year but didn't, they're trying to catch that wave and they see that they can't get the same kind of prices they were during the pandemic. Um, they're, they're opening up. They're, uh, the amount of people that overpaid for houses is unbelievable. The point is uh, the market is just right for, if, you haven't, if you're not getting rich right now in real estate, something is wrong. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that. I'm also building and holding. So I'm building to rent at this point. And um, I like to buy all cash, don't have a mortgage on it. And maybe some time down the line, I'll pull the money out. But right now I'm just kind of uh, floating with that. So that's what my business looks like today. Just creative real estate and building to rent. Doing a little bit of wholesaling as well. Not a lot. And um, really just enjoying life, man. I, I enjoy creating my YouTube videos, to be honest, you know, it's something that I feel like I'm giving back to the community. Um, I have inexpensive courses. I have expensive programs um, based on the time commitment. Um, I try not to, I, I don't really pitch anything to anybody. Uh, I think the information kind of sells itself and, you know, I, you know, it's just my style. Um, but my biggest thing is helping. I, I've created time and freedom for myself and my family. Um, I'm trying to help other people create time and freedom as well. I've even done it with my with my daughter. She when she was 14, she got her first thirteen thousand dollar check in real estate at wow. 14 years old. Wow. I have a video a video on YouTube about that. You know, so um, I'm just trying to share this information with as many people as possible. You know, real estate absolutely changed my life. I don't know where I would be had I not started investing. I'm you know, I was I grew up in the projects. I was a you know, I, I made a, I'm not going to put any numbers out there, but I made a, a, a ton of money by the time I was 25 and I made some mistakes. I overspent and I was broke at 27. Um, so I had to find other ways in order to make this work. And I was semi-retired by the time I was 30, you know, so, you know, everybody makes mistakes, but it's not the things that you, it's not the, the, the past that that's going to make you, um, who you are today. It's the things you experience that make you the person you are today. So if you experience enough and you apply, you can uh, achieve tremendous things. And I'm living proof of it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, and where can, where can people find you? Where can they check you out on YouTube, um, Instagram, every, just everywhere, websites, whatever you'd like to leave with the people so they can keep in touch with you and follow what you have going on. Sure, man. Um, I like to direct people to my YouTube. That's where I feel like I provide the most value. Um, it's youtube.com at uh, forward slash at Jamel Gibbs, um, which is my first and last name. Uh, you can even check me out on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok as well. I'm also on Facebook, but I don't think anybody's on Facebook these days. <laughs> <laughs> Dope, man. Jamel, anything else you want to leave with the people before we go? You know, honestly, man, um, if I had to leave some last words of advice, it would be this. Think about, think about your journey, right? Think about what your end goal is. What does three years look like from, from right now, right? Figure out what you want your life to be because this is all by design, right? You can literally, especially in this country, it's so easy to become wealthy. I don't know, you know, they say the, the poorest person, poor people, the poor class in this country are wealthier than rich people in other countries. It's unbelievable, right? So you really don't have an excuse to make this happen. So think about, by design, think about what the perfect situation would be for you in three years from now, and then create the game plan to get to that, right? You don't get in a car, you don't... Um, put the car and drive and drive off without a destination. You got to know where you're going before you actually get there. You get in the car, you um, put the car and drive. You might go down road. Number one, you might have a roadblock. Are you going to give up on your dreams? Are you going to give up on reaching your destination? No, you're going to find another. Most people will find another route in real life, right? So you go down road. Number two, there may be a traffic jam. Do you 
stop at the tra- traffic jam. No, you got somewhere to go. You go down road number three, there's a clear path to your destination. It's the same thing in business, right? If you know where you're going and you, you know you have the vehicle to get there, the car to get there is real estate, you're the driver. Yes, you're going to hit some roadblocks, but most people, the difference is in, in, in business, most people give up, right? So rather than giving up, find another road. If that road wasn't it, find another one. Eventually, you're going to get there. The person who stays in the game the longest, who never quits, is the one that wins, right? So you don't have to be the best athlete as long as you stay in the game. If you stay in the game, you will score the most points. And that's the name of the game. You just got to keep pushing. And if you're, if you're consistent over a long period of time, there's no way you can fail. So that's what I want to leave you with today. There you have it. There you have it. Oh, uh, man, Jamel, thank you again. Really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. I'm excited to play it back. I got to try some of the stuff that that you mentioned um, during during the episode. And appreciate um, appreciate that scenario. I mean, that's I, I've actually never we actually never done that before. So I appreciate uh, appreciate that. It was impromptu, and I loved it. Um, but thank you again. Really appreciate you um, jumping on the show. And thank you to everyone for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a rating and review. I look forward to hearing from you all soon. Hi, everyone. Sam here from Black Real Estate Dialogue. Make sure to hit that notification bell and that subscribe button and to visit us at blackrealestatedialogue.com.